Today we are diving deep into hypothyroidism and we're going to go a little bit further than what I have done in the past. And with me today is the best-selling author, uh, amazing, gorgeous woman who is brilliant and has helped me every step of the way with my own thyroid issues and is my good friend, Elle Russ. Welcome, Elle. Hey, so glad to be here. So happy to help everyone and have this, you know, niche discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited because we've only ever, I've done my own stuff on hypothyroidism. You and I have had a discussion on here before as well. So I'm going to link to our first interview in the show notes. So if you're interested in kind of getting the background on Elle, if you, ha if you don't know much about her, well, you can find her on a, you know, countless podcasts and summits if you just Google her name. But I have done another show with her, a couple shows actually, but um, specifically hypothyroid, we've done one, I think it was almost two years ago now. And you can also check out, we did a women's empowerment summit last spring. Um, if you haven't seen that, it's definitely worth going and checking out. And we talk about our own stories with our health on that one as well. But we also have an amazing series of interviews uh, with different health professionals, authors, all about empowering women. So you can check that out at the Women's Empowerment Project on YouTube. And I've been slowly releasing episodes on this podcast uh, from the Women's Empowerment Project. So you can find them to download as well. So, L. <laughs> so I would like to start actually... I do want to go back and I know you've talked about your story on the other podcast, but I do want to go back to when you were in that time of discovering that you had hypothyroidism I and mean, here you were, you know, you were young, healthy, relative, you ate relatively well, you were, you're an actress, you were a comedian and suddenly these symptoms started to creep up. And I just want you to kind of give us an overview of what started to happen because I think it's still being so overlooked by so many women that I want you to tell us what was going on as far as symptoms went. Sure. So one of the first symptoms that I noticed uh, was that I got my period when I shouldn't have. Um, you know, I had regular periods. I was 30 years old and I got it two weeks later. And I thought, okay, that's a fluke. Then I got it again two weeks later. So that's very common because oftentimes when people have thyroid issues, they will have it manifest in a gynecological way. So infertility, miscarriages, um, weird fibroids, abnormal bleeding, heavy bleeding, lots of clots. I mean, any kind of thing that's not cool down there. Um, and for guys, not getting erections when you should, because, you know, then that would low thyroid affects testosterone and it can lower it. And then they get not only sleepy and ugh from the low thyroid, but then they can have issues there as well. So sexually, like gynecologically, it can manifest somehow. And that includes even like a possible misdiagnosis like I got for polycystic ovarian syndrome and some other things like that. So those are completely thyroid ignited. Um, and so that's the one place to look. So that was happening to me. Now, at the same time, my, I was getting bloated and I was gaining a ton of weight and I couldn't lose it. And not just weight, like just excess fat. My eyes were puffy. Um, I started to get acne when I never had acne in my life. I had perfect skin. I had like real cystic BS acne. Um, I got so heavy and fat, even while working out and trying to restrict calories and doing everything that I thought was right, that's a huge sign. The other sign was I was, you're freezing all the time. I was 96 degrees, even in the afternoon. You know who you are if you're the person that's cold all the time when other people aren't. That's usually a sign. It also could be like, you just have like low body fat and you're really fit. And maybe that's it. But for the most part, if you're having other symptoms, that's the one. So sometimes people can catch it from just uh, there's a success story in my book, Morgan, who is the CEO of Primal Kitchen Foods, and she, uh, she caught it. She was really one of the lucky ones. She was freezing cold for a couple of weeks, went to the doctor. The doctor actually knew what to test, tested her, and started to fix her. So she didn't have to spiral down the cascade of all of the other symptoms. So when it got really bad, because I was undiagnosed for two years... Not just the bleeding clots, I developed a fibroid and a polyp in my uterus, misdiagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, I did have low testosterone, low DHEA. I, my, my hair lost its curliness. Um, I would wake up and there would be like, 
I'd have bangs, like my hair would be falling out in weird chunks that were strange and like kind of being ripped off. It felt weird. It felt like a r- rubber bands. Like my, my hair was real like bouncy and weird, but then would break easily. And I can't explain that other than if it's happening to you, you're like, oh my God. <laughs> um, I had heavy legs. So when I walked up a flight of stairs, it felt like I had really heavy cement legs. That's usually related to low iron, low ferritin, and also thyroid. Um, As well, because I had low ferritin as a result of hypothyroidism, I was passing out a lot, getting faint and dizzy. Often I would have that thing, even when I was hypo, where I'd stand up and I'd be dizzy right away. That's an adrenal thyroid thing. Inner itching of the ears. Um, Cracked heels, dry skin. In fact, one of the really random ones, but it's so prevalent that I have to mention it, which is so you have both your hands and it's usually the right hand, no matter what you write with, but it's usually the right hand and it's the index finger. And it's like a, along the side of your index finger, not on the bottom, not on the top, but on the side, there will be like dry, cracked, scaly skin that no amount of straight up oil, lotion, protecting it from water will fix. That is so related to all of this, like reverse T3, low ferritin, um, and iron. Um, anytime, you wake up, like you'd wake up and feel like your eyes were almost like puffed shut, like just puffy face upon waking. Um, another symptom too, people, when they lay down in the evening, they feel their heart thumping in their chest. It feels very worrisome. It feels like, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack. Cause you can like feel it and almost like hear it through your ears. That feeling is not you having a heart attack. That's usually low T3, but it's also usually low ferritin. So sometimes people think when they have that feeling like, oh my God, uh, my, it's, 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 it's not that. It's not, there's actually something wrong with your heart. It's, it's the iron storage. And so there's, we can get into more of that. But so those are just some of the symptoms. There's also many others. I had over 30 that are in the book, but that's kind of the basics. And you know, also any amount of diet that does not work at all after six weeks, got there's some, there's some metabolic Effery going on there. It could, you check the thyroid right away. If that's not it, you look at everything else, you know? Yeah. And just test wise, I know that people always say, I go, well, I had my TSH checked and, and that is not an indication of whether or not there's always a thyroid problem. It can be, but it's not always. And I know that you, did you not go to your doctor when this was all happening and they were? I did. They, and he just tested the TSH and he goes, you're fine. Everything's fine. Uh, and he tapped, he took his hand and he tapped on my gym shoes and he goes, use these more. Oh, oh my God. And, and I, I wanted to be like, mother fu- I yeah. <laughs> every day. I'm working out two hours a day. I'm eating like I was the pillar of fitness before this happened. Like I know what I'm doing. Now that's the other thing too, is you really have doctors that will care on in my book is another success story who basically was accused of having like some closet eating disorder. She's like, I'm training for a marathon. I know what the F I'm doing. You know, like yeah. I'm not, and she gained 30 pounds in a year and she was Hashimoto's and she'd been an endocrinologist for 14, for 10 years, had two miscarriages. They put her on Synthroid. No one had ever tested her for Hashimoto's. They made her feel crazy for years that she might need antidepressants. Maybe she was had a closet eating disorder because she's very tall and skinny and she gained like 30 pounds. And I even remember at the time being like, how is she getting fat? Because she was just one of those people that was always like, you know, tall and thin, could wear the skinny jeans, just a really slim person. And um, they never, the endocrinologist never tested her free T3 all these years. We looked back at her blood work. They only tested TSH and T4. Um, and the bottom line is that's also an argument for why T4 only is not optimal. Kara needed direct T3. And now she takes about four grains of nature throughout a day, but she takes compounded. So it's, but it's in the exact same amounts. She takes two grains in the morning and two in the, in the evening. She's been on that for ever and she's doing great. And then she took the second half of it when we found out about grains and Hashimoto's and she said, uh Oh, cause she was like the last person to quit effing oatmeal like i never thought i could convince her she was like i'm not giving up pot. like she Women was don't people- want to give up their oatmeal no one oatmeal's the one they hold on to it's, all, it's like they hold on to that one and it's just such bs i love the way ken berry talks about it because he knows and he's done a lot of <laughs> he's done so many videos on it where he's like you don't need your oatmeal um yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people, so she was one of those people I just never thought would quit eating grains. And um, when she found out and looked at, you know, I shared with her this, the, the evidence about, you know, gluten and the Hashimoto's antibodies. She was feeling good, but she went paleo primal, had a few cheats. 
her antibodies, her TPO antibodies went from 300 to 25, which was the lowest she's ever seen it. The reason you want to do that, and I'm sure I've said this on the last one, is you can be on thyroid hormone, have Hashimoto's, feel great. But then there's these antibodies in the background and you don't actually feel the antibodies. So your doctor tests them and goes, yeah, okay, your thyroid looks good. You're on the right dose. Oh, and there's antibodies there. Yep, they're still there. And they don't know that you can do something about them. But you can, and you should, and you want to get them down to the lowest they possibly can be or to undetectable levels because antibodies equal inflammation, equal begetting, a whole host of other issues, other autoimmune issues, chances of cancers increase like 200%. Um, women are more likely to give birth to children of um, autism spectrum disorder. So, you know, there are lots of reasons to do the numbers down. Get the numbers down through through diet, or if the worst case scenario and someone can't do it through diet, then low dose naltrexone, and that's literally on the last page of the Q and A in the book, uh, my book, Paleothyroid Solution with Dr. Forsman. So that can be a powerful bringer down of antibodies for any autoimmune issue. Um, so sorry, yeah, that was I, probably I, like a little off track, but no, I just but I, I would like to say too. I remember hearing recently, and I thought this was so brilliant. Somebody saying you can if you've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, consider it a gateway the gateway autoimmune condition. It's usually the first to arrive and take it as a warning sign that you are inflamed and you've got more autoimmune conditions coming down the pipeline if you don't get those numbers down. So it is extremely important to bring those antibodies down. And, and the example that I just gave of Kara is also a great example in this arena too. Kara was one of my friends who was allergic to the most random things. She was like allergic to tuna, but not salmon, limes, but not lemon, uh, pure cotton, but not a mixed, bl like it was crazy. And she got actually allergy shots for a while there. It was because, so when she finally got to the right doctor, and this is the story she tells in the book, is she, her doctor looked at her and said, if, I, if you weren't sitting in front of me, I would think that I'm looking at a patient who just went through chemo and radiation. That's how bad her immune system was, okay? So they cleaned up her immune system. They got her on a T4, T3 combo. She's fixed. Okay, cut to present day. It's been years now. She's doing great. She literally, I never thought I'd see the day where she ate eggs. She was deathly allergic, like not deathly, but she was very allergic to eggs. The only dish that she would eat with eggs was her family Christmas egg dish. Once a year, she'd have to take Benadryl before she ate it. And that's the only time she ate eggs. Now she's scrambling up eggs and just eating them. So again, her Hashimoto's being out of control spawned kind of an allergic, another autoimmune response to other things. You get that immune system at, at bay and you control that reaction and you're going to be less sensitive. She can eat stuff now she's not allergic to anymore. Yeah. And the same with when, with my hypothyroidism, I had multiple food sensitivities and I kept getting more and more and more. And I was like, my diet's good. I don't have, like, I knew I didn't, I couldn't, there's no way I would have a leaky gut because I felt like I was doing everything right. I knew what I was doing, but I kept developing food sensitivities. And I had these rash that would come all over the back of my neck, all over my arms. And it was avocado and chocolate and lemons and not limes. Like I had all these weird Food sensitivities, when I got on the right medication, all of them went away. When I went, when I started having a reverse T3 problem, they all came back. That's, That's because that reverse back. T3 is hypothyroidism. Yes. Right? And so then they all came out and started the, the T3 only. Now they're all gone again. And so there is like, there's just so many connections. And I really, I, I want to tell everybody right now, um, lrust.com, Paleothyroid Solution is the book. It saved my life, and I know it saved many others. And these stories that she's talking about, they're in there, and she walks you through all of it. And I just I want to say that right now. I'm not waiting till the end of the podcast to say it because it's an important piece. Uh, so check it out. If you suspect you have a thyroid issue, if you have hypothyroidism, you have to get the book, period. Okay. So L, now let's dig in farther here. Yeah. So what I want to talk about is, okay, so there's, let's, there's so many women out there that, A, they're being put on Synthroid, which we know is not right. And tell us, tell us why that's not right quickly, and then I want to get into reverse T3. Sure. Uh, so, and again, you know, Karen and I are jumping into stuff, assuming that a lot of people yeah. listening already have like kind of, so if you're really new to thyroid, and also... 
aside from my book that you mentioned, if you go to lrust.com, there's a free thyroid guide tab. You click that. There's podcasts of me talking about this with the doctor on my book, entry level stuff, some of the success stories and the list of tests to get. Like you don't necessarily need to buy my book to get on the right path. So, you know, that's available to everybody. Um, so, okay. So let's, you wanted to get into for reverse T3, but first we want to talk about the Y T T4. Yeah, because we have to kind of lead up to the different steps. Cause so usually the first step is getting the diagnosis. And like she said there, we have lots of, she has lots of content. So do I about getting the right diagnosis. So let's assume somebody's been diagnosed. They've got, they say the doctor says, okay, you've got hypothyroidism. Here's your Synthroid or your Levothyroxine, which is straight T4 medication. And that seems to be what everybody gets started at. And that doesn't work for, what would you say, 95% of women? 90, 95? I'm not sure because, you know, Synthroid is like a number one selling drug and it works, quote, works for a lot of people. When I say that, it's do we know? Because there's a lot of people I know who have been on Synthroid for years that just have symptoms still and assume like, oh, well, I'm taking some medication, so it's better, but it's not great, but that must be because I have this thyroid problem and they're just with an idiot doctor. So do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how we'd be even able to tell because the ones that are severely failing, might we might know about, but the ones that are just kind of hanging in this crappy place where it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind Which of okay. It seems like there's so many. I meet women every day that tell me they're on Synthroid or Levothyroxine and they're, and I'm like, yeah, do you, well, do you still feel hypo? Oh yeah. Like they don't know. They just assume that this is how it goes. Right. Get, and it's um, not how it should be by the, the way. T4 that and you feel the same. Yeah. And here's why it's wrong or not wrong, but here's why it fails a lot of people. So a couple of first things first, if you are listening and you are on Levothyroxine, which is the just chemical name for T4, you want to get onto the brand name right away, particularly in the US. I'm not sure how it is in Canada, but you want to get on the brand name because the doctor in my book and other doctors I have spoken to claim that this is one drug they do not prescribe generically because the generic level thyroxine has wonky stuff with liver enzymes and also with thyroid. So at the very least, if you're on T4 only, get to the brand name Synthroid that I have heard. And my doctor and the doctor on my book, um, he prescribes everything to patients for 30 years. And if he's saying that is the one thing I will not prescribe generic, uh, take heed, okay? Because that says a lot. Now, the other reason that it's so, so okay, let's say you're on Synthroid and you're on the brand name. The reason it's not optimal or often fails people is because our bodies don't work on just conversion alone. T4 is useless, completely useless, unless it converts into the thing that matters, which is T3, okay? So, you can give a patient all the T4 you want. Is it converting to the thing that matters? Oh, Kara got screwed on that, right? Because I just mentioned her endocrinologist for 10 years only tested TSH and T4. So they, they were given her the stuff to get to the thing that worked, but they never tested to go, is this working? Yeah, unbelievable. And, and not only is it converting, but is it converting to the proper amounts? And I guarantee you, had they done that, like, because she showed up like a cancer victim, right? you know what I mean? <laughs> Chemotherapy victim. Um, they would have seen how disastrously hypothyroid she was. So T4 is the storage hormone that actually converts into the stuff that actually matters, which is T3, which is what I take by itself and now Karen's taking by itself and we can, we'll get into why we ended up there. Um, so our bodies don't rely on conversion alone. We do, our, if you're normal and your thyroid's working great, then it is dispensing some T4 and some T3. Okay, it's not just giving you T4 and then relying on conversion alone for you to be well. And, and so it's not endocrine mimicry. How did that problem arise? Here's how it's very easy. So in the 1800s, this English physician was a genius. He extracted sheep thyroid gland and he injected it into people with big goiters on their necks and it worked, thus became natural desiccated thyroid. But he, the, in the 50s, they couldn't patent the drug companies could not patent natural desiccated thyroid. So they invented T4. And then they put out a bunch of propaganda to the natural stuff saying it was all terrible. T4 is the one only stop shop for thyroid hormone replacement. This is how you treat the problem. This is the only way to go. And then endocrinologists became absolute Synthroid Nazis and the Endocrinologists Association, that's their first order of business. So that's a lot of doctors' first order of business. Now, if you go to a functional doctor, an integrative MD, or a, a DO, people that are truly steeped in the latest knowledge, they will likely start you off on natural desiccated thyroid. 
There may be scenarios though, based on blood work, where it's just a little bit of T4 only is appropriate. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but just because it often does fail and it's not endocrine mimicry, you have to tread lightly and really make sure you're getting all the proper testing. So T4 can still work for someone. Synthroid could be really great for some people. I know people on Synthroid and they're like, all right, I'm fine. So, okay. But again, you just have to, it's individual. And so those are the nuances there. I would still not suggest it. I, I think unless it's completely valid based on blood work and other things that maybe the person only needs a little T4 or something and that by itself, I just don't usually see those scenarios. I see scenarios that call for T4 and T3 together, which is what our bodies do anyway. And so the ratio of T4 to T3 in any given dosage of desiccated thyroid is kind of a, a little bit of an 80-20, I guess. Yeah. And so if, if a person's been on Synthroid or Levothyroxine and they're not feeling well, and they would like to try it, then we obviously suggest advocating for yourself, getting into your doctors and asking to try the natural desiccated thyroid. You know, it comes in uh, down in the States, it's Armour, Nature Throid. In Canada, it's called Urfa. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of physicians, like she said, that are very familiar with desiccated thyroid or feel comfortable prescribing it. So you may need to find a functional medicine practitioner that's willing to work with you on it. I mean, always you can try your doctor first, but don't stop there if they, they, they don't recommend it. Don't stop there. If you're not feeling well, keep going. And I just really want to push that out there because I get a lot of women lately, actually, I've had a, a number of women telling me, I'm so nervous to go talk to my doctor about this. I don't know. Do you find that too, Al? Like with people you're I working have people with? Who call me just because they want to get coached on how to talk to their talk doctor. To the doctor <laughs> yeah. I'm not even joking. I have had, and including some friends who have called me and they're like, all right, I need to go in and have this conversation. <laughs> how do I do it? You know, it's like kind of no different than people coming to me and being like, how do I ask my boss for a raise? <laughs> it's just yes. like, um, and you know, I think it's because, um, well, first of all, in my free thyroid guide, I actually have a list of questions. So you can call, like, how do you kind of suss it out before you even get there and waste your money and time. That's not to say you're not going to still waste your money and time. I have called offices before, asked the right questions, gotten the right answers and gotten in there, total moron. So yeah, I can't yeah. promise you it's yeah. always going to be fail safe. But in my free thyroid guide, I do have a list of questions on how to even tell if maybe that office is right for you. Endocrinologists classically will not, okay, care, back to Kara, the, the successor in my book, at the time when she was complaining, I remember them catch, they kept switching her T4. They kept switching the Synthroid. She's complaining and they're upping the dose and she's like not getting better and they're accusing her of closet eating disorders. And um, so at the time, I remember being like, well, why don't you ask them about armor? Because I had started armor then and I was like on my way. And she came back and she said, my doctor said that armor is for pigs, not humans. So you're going to get that from endocrinologists. You're going to get things like it's unsteady and unstable. That's absolutely 100% untrue. This is as stable as any medication out there that is FDA. You know what I mean? It's, it, it, it's absolutely consistent. It's not like you get a pill of armor nature throid and you don't know what you're going to get. Like that's ridiculous. So yeah, even my naturopath said that to me. He was like, well, maybe you should just switch to Synthroid because it's more regulated. You can really, you know, you know what you're getting. No, no, it's really not. And there, and here's the thing. The reason doctors like it or prefer it or have this false 30, 40-year-old notion that it's the way to go is because T4 has a much longer half-life in the body than T3. I mean, and look, that's why this is an elegant system. The brain, the pituitary, the TSH... Thyroid stimulating hormone comes from the pituitary. It's a little wake-up call. It says, yo, yo, thyroid, wake up. Thyroid dispenses T4 and T3. A lot of that T4 is going to be converted throughout the day to the T3 that you need, and whatever's not converted is going to be fleshed out through reverse T3, and that's this wonderful, elegant feedback loop. And we have it because T3 is very powerful. So T4 acts as the steady storage hormone, and if it needs to pull back through reverse T3 because something awful happened, someone just got cancer, someone just got hit by a car, there's trauma and stress, the body might downregulate. In that case, yeah, you, you, so you want the reverse T3 mechanism. You want this whole thing to work properly. Um, so, so that's how it goes. But to rely on the signal 
or the pro hormone, I mean the, the storage hormone is ridiculous, but it's steady. And so that's why they like it because T3 by itself, and this is why doctors don't like it is because it isn't steady. It's got a much shorter half-life in the body. You know, it can peak and dissipate within four hours, not drastically all the time, but that that's kind of how it works. So doctors don't like that because what if a patient goes without it? What if they're in a, get hit by a car and they're in a coma and no one knows they're on medication or those are all very extreme examples that never really happen in life. And you can always make preparations for such, such potential disasters. But at the end of the day, so like that's, again, the T4 is useless unless it converts to the thing that matters. Now there are people that say, well, T4 is actually important to brain function and hair and all this kind of other stuff. Mm, I don't know. I've been on T3 only for seven years. My hair's, I don't fit, you know, so I, I wrote a book, my brain's working. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Uh, but I will say though, that there's no studies that definitively say that T4 is absolutely necessary. There's people that, you know, you can live without it. Um, again, it's useless unless it converts to the thing that does the job. And the only thing that does the job, the only active the, bio, the only act, biologically active thyroid hormone is T3. That's why everybody's free T3 result corresponds with how they're feeling most of the time. And that is why when you miss that test, you miss everything. Yeah. Same with reverse T3. We can get into that now if you want. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to dive a little bit into dosing when you're switching from Synthroid or maybe you're, you've been properly diagnosed with hypothyroidism and you've got a functional medicine practitioner or a doctor who is willing to put you on Nature Thyroid Armor, IRFA, and they say, I'll see, here's your 30 you know, milligrams, one, one grain or two grains tops, right? I, I've never seen it go beyond 60. Uh, or two, I think that's two grains in the States. Um, and then they say, I'll see you in three months. And my own practitioner did this and I love my naturopath and he's fantastic, but he said, I'll see you in three months. And he gave me, put me on a 30 milligram, which is that half grain? It's a half grain. It's half grain. Um, so I was half grain and said, see you in three months. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is a problem that I deal with all the time. So people are often given, first of all, 30 milligrams now, I did, for example, I saw some labs yesterday that would indicate that half a grain might be all that that person needs. What do I mean by that? Their free T4 was 1.0 and that range that I'm talking about is the one that goes up to 1.7. Their TSH was like 1.9, 2.0, up to five. That's, that's right in, it's right in the, the line there with proper thyroid function. And her free T3 was just like two points below the mid range. So now in that case, something that's small might be the answer for that person. However, when people are seriously hypothyroid and everything's kind of tanked and screwed, uh, I've never seen anyone uh, get better on, on that. So it's usually an entry-level dose. And when I say entry-level, I mean only for three days. And when I say entry-level, I mean only for three days if that patient is so allergic sensitive and has a lot of freak outs about stuff that they take and like is really sensitive, then that's the only reason why you would give someone 30 milligrams of armor or, or 32.5 of nature throid. They're, they're basically the same stuff. And you, you know, just to take it for three days to make sure there's no like crazy allergic reaction to something, right? Like a filler or something. If, if the person's really sensitive, other than that, you pretty much start off with one grain, which is 60 milligrams of either Eartha armor or nature three. And the reason you don't wait three months is this. So now I've introduced an exogenous hormone because my intention is that I need to take over this faulty ass system that isn't working. Right. Though, in the case where the girl could probably benefit from that half a grain, she's just adding and assisting and just kind of topping it off, right? That might be her story because of her labs and where she's at. But for the most part, when you're tanked, you do fully replace this feedback loop. You take over for it by giving it to yourself. So when you start to introduce exogenous hormones of any kind, by the way, so testosterone, whatever, doesn't matter, your own production and your own feedback loop of whatever that is, is going to stop working not stop working, but it's going to shut up. It's going to shut down and stop, you know, sending the messages because it's getting what it was producing for you. So basically as you introduce it, it's very important and doctors and patients may make this mistake all the time. It's very important to up in a timely manner because likely you are going to need more than that 60 milligrams. But if 60 milligrams is your dose, well, lucky you and you'll know, and you should get tested four weeks later to confirm that. 
it wouldn't just be confirmed through blood results. It would be confirmed through, I feel great. Labs look good. Let me hang out here. I'll even get tested another four weeks just to make sure that that 60 milligrams was the way to go, you know, but you have to basically get tested. The idea is get tested. I say every three and a half weeks after a new dose or starting a dose because you get tested. That's enough time for the T4 in desiccated to make its storage and do its thing and see how val valid that is in the body. But it, it it's also, um, so it's enough time for that, but also then you get tested on three and a half weeks, like, and then there's the blood draw. Then it's going to take five days to get back to the doctor, call the office, or it might take five days with the lab. Now you're at four weeks, right? So again, how quickly do you want to get better? You have to climb up the ladder. And in order to get to, pe now people will be like, why don't you just guess shot a, a dose right off the bat? I did see, and I was alarmed to see when I spoke to someone the other day and they told me that their doctor literally gave them four grains a day and said, here you go, take two grains in the morning, two grains in the afternoon, and they had never been on any thyroid medication. That's not right, people. That's a very poor decision. And the reason you have to kind of do it, you know, in this kind of piecemeal way is because it does take time for T4 to kind of get in there, do its job, sit, convert, get steady. All right, now where are we at? Oh, we need more. Okay, give it more. Now, you know, you need to build upon it. You never just give someone their ultimate dose of thyroid hormone right away. It just, it, 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 it would be really uncomfortable. It could be very dangerous to give someone zero T3, all of a sudden shoot them up with a whole shitload of stuff. So um, that's a fail too. Is, so you never, so you never really want to take more than 60 milligrams as a starting dose. Uh, I mean, sometimes people could take 90, I guess. I would always start with 60. And then, I mean, again, there's, there's reasons for why yeah. people would take less. But aside from that, you would start off with 60 and then get tested every three and a half weeks, check in. Blood pressure, temps, everything. How am I feeling? Where are the labs? Okay, now you add from there. Um, and you never, rule of thumb, classically, it, probably not a good idea to take more than two grains in one dose. Mm -hmm. so that's where multidosing comes in. So for example, if you need to be on four grains a day, because that's what you need, you do not take that all in the morning. You do two and two. You either do an even split or two to one. So if you're on four, you might be two and two to make it easier. There are people that dose desiccated three times a day. I think two is optimal. Um, for the people that have to be on more than four grains, they might need to do you know, a three, three doser. But for the most part, you, you want to multidose beyond taking two grains, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And you and, might even do it sooner because someone's optimal dose might be two grains. And then in that case, they might want to take a grain and a half in the morning and then half a grain in the afternoon. So again, this is really individual based on people's labs or situations, but you never stay on an entry level dose of any hormone for Christ's sakes, but particularly not thyroid hormone for more than three and a half weeks. Like you got to be on it. You go get tested yourself or you say, I want to get, come back here in three and a half weeks. I want to make sure we are because then what happens is you can actually end up becoming more hypo so then people give up and they go i'm feeling worse it's been a couple of months this is terrible i'm even getting more hypo symptoms than i never even had before i start and that actually can happen to you as you start desiccated as you start to introduce these hormones you might have a little lapse there one day where you get a symptom you didn't have but then it goes away so things can just kind of be wavy until you get steadied out but but hopefully all that makes sense and if you have any questions let me know yeah. And I think it's, I mean, I remember I said to my naturopath, I said, he said, I'll see you in three months. I said, no, I'll see you in four weeks. <laughs> and that's all you have to say. I mean, it's up to you. You're paying them. So go back in four weeks. And my advice is to really just please tune into your body. Like there, if there's one piece of advice is listen to your intuition, listen to your gut, because I felt exactly what she's talking about. I felt it. I, and I thank God I had L at the time to tell me this, but I started Urfa, you know, three weeks. I felt really good. I was like, oh, I, I can, I feel the difference. I've got some energy. And then it started to tank. And I was like, oh, I don't feel good anymore. And I went through this week of feeling like garbage, retested, had to up my dose, started feeling good again. And I went through this. It probably took me almost six months to get to a dose where it started to, where I knew it was right before. So I wasn't doing this roller coaster ride anymore. And, I, and I'm individual, like, like she said, it's an, per individual. Maybe you won't feel as drastic as I did because I also had a reverse T3 issue happening, but you know, f tune in, you're going to feel that and you're going to know if it's too much, too little, 
you know, do your tests, do the, the temperature. And you might be thinking, oh my God, girls, this is a little bit overwhelming. Like what you're saying, like, come on. Well, but, you know, I know it seems like, overwhelming. I know it seems overwhelming, but like once you really get into it, yeah, you can okay. theoretically grasp what's happening. Listen, I do not have a science degree. I you asked me what twelve percent of something is, and I'm my brain hurts. <laughs> I can't even. I, I'm like never, never could never get a medical degree. Like I could never commit. I I don't need. I can't even do algebra, people. Like seriously. So uh, if I can grasp it, because again, but I do have a philosophical mind. If you can grasp it on a theoretical level, you can understand it, and, and that's why I explain it that way. That's why I try to do all these interviews as much as I can, so people can wrap their head around it. And again, you can go back. There's hundreds of interviews of me explaining the whole, th- you know, things that we're not. We're we're going straight to stuff. Usually, what happens is, in absence of a reverse T3 problem, meaning in absence of a problem where T4 is not converting to T3, meaning everything's going right, you get progressively better if you do it in a timely manner and you don't have dip backs. You don't. The reason you did is because, again, we, and that was sketchy because, see, the testing with you, Karen, was like the reverse T3 test had to be sent to the States. Then that was a different unit of measurement, and it was like really difficult to figure out this damn ratio. <laughs> and honestly, by the way, even devoid of a, a reverse T3 uh, problem, and people can look up my interview with Maureen Vincenti. She's a primal health coach as well. She's on T3 only, and she never necessarily got tested for reverse T3. She just couldn't handle T4. She just, for whatever reason, it just didn't work for her. Same with Paul Robinson, the author of Recovering with T3, who's amazing. Um, So again, sometimes it just doesn't work for people. But yeah, you want to do it in a timely manner. And T3, you can actually, T3 only, meaning so if you're like Karen or I, and you have to go on T3 only at some point, now that you can adjust that dosage kind of as much as you want, meaning you don't need to really wait to see because it's very fast acting. So for example, if you took too large of a dose for some reason and misgaged something, you, you would probably tell and then you correct it because it'll dissipate at some point and then you don't do that again the next time. Uh, with T4, it's just, again, that storage hormone and the way that it works in the body, it's, it's, you have to kind of wait. You don't want to like up and change your dose every now, like you can't do that. Mm. With T3, you can do more fine tuning on a, every couple day basis to get to where you need to go. In fact, you can almost get there faster than NDT. Uh, That's not a reason to do it because you do not want to go on T3 unless you have to. And here's why. The reason T3 is not optimal and the reason you do not want to go on T3 unless you absolutely have to, you do want that whole feedback loop to work that I just talked about because it's got the reverse T3 element in there. You want that. That's your body's emergency break. So this is how I liken it. It's like, you have type two diabetes and you, and you shoot insulin, you, you're doing the, you're doing the biology in your head and you're a human. Okay. And you're going to have problems with that, which is why if you have type two diabetes, it's really would behoove you to work with a primal functional doctor and wean off insulin and get on a primal low carb, maybe even keto diet with a doctor and, and do it that way because you want the organ to do its thing that it does because that's what it does. And we're a human brain. So the same goes for T3. If you're taking T3 only, the reason this mechanism kind of gets canceled out is because T3 only does not convert into reverse T3, which is why it's saving my life and Karen's life and everyone else who takes it who has a conversion issue. It's the last choice though, and least optimal though, because again, we're judging it. T4 is the brain, really. I'm the human brain, T4 is the body brain. So T4 and the T3, T4 will decide when to convert, right? Pull back and flush out through reverse T3 if too much, Um, you know, it's basically managing the heavy metabolic hormone of T3 versus a human. So it's a lot trickier. It's a lot more attention to detail. It's a lot more really paying attention as fluctuations happen as you get better in life. If you're on NDT or a T4, T3 combo or even T4 only, it's kind of deciding for you when you need more or less T3. So... Well, in general, though, once you get on a T3 dose and you've been there for a while, you, you, you stay there until you reach a new level of health because you're now on hypo and then you reach a new plateau and then sometimes you need to reduce. Basically, more often than not, you become more T3 efficient over time, which is a, a phrase I coined because you, you become more caloric efficient, you become more efficient, right? Because now you're at a, the right primordial baseline of, of soupy enzymes and temperature and now everything's working right. So, you know, from there, 
as things get better, you might notice that you'll need to reduce. Same could go for NDT as well. And people usually, once they're on their optimal dose, you only need to get tested like twice a year unless a problem comes up. And then I always say you go to temps right away and see what's going on there. And then you go to the doctor and you get tested because you may need to increase or decrease that. But it wouldn't be as fluctuating or potentially as much as someone who's starting off T3. In that first year, you might be altering the doses more often than anyone would who was on NDT. Yeah. So let's talk about what's what happens then when someone's then on, like I was, taking their natural desiccated thyroid and they're feeling pretty good usually for a while. You did, I did. It was like, okay, yeah, I've got this. Yeah. And then suddenly those hypo symptoms come raging back, even though the numbers on the lab reports are pretty damn good. My T3 was over the upper half of the range. And that's how I was like, oh, this, I am not hyper. I do not feel that I'm getting any of that T3 because I started to go way down. I came from here and then I started to crash. And at first it was like, geez, am I just really tired? Do I have an adrenal issue? Do I, you know, blaming all these things? Like maybe I just need to take a holiday. Maybe I need to take a break because they were, those symptoms were, way worse than they ever had been. And I don't know if that was the same for you when you went into reverse. So just explain what happens when we start, when this starts to happen, what's going on here? So what happens is, is that the T4 in whatever you're taking or, or the, or, or the T4 that your own body's giving you, people can get reverse T3 problems and not be on thyroid hormones. That happens all the time. In fact, morning sickness with pregnant women, that's actually a reverse T3 issue. You're kidding. I was, I puked for nine months straight in both my pregnancies. Well, doesn't that say a lot knowing what we know now? Yes. <laughs> so uh, that's what Dr. Forsman told me. He's like, that's actually a reverse. So here's the thing. I've reverse- always wondered that. I've always wondered that. Yeah. Reverse T3 is a measure of wellness and unwellness in anyone's body. Wow. Yeah. Let me explain this. So it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. I have a friend, um, I'm helping out my cousin's friend in Hawaii and I said, go get the reverse T3 tested. He goes, she won't do it. And I go push her again. And and this is what he said. He goes, they don't do that unless they don't test reverse T3 unless you're like in the ICU. Wow. Do you know what the ICU is? That's intensive care unit. That's like your shit. You're going to die. Right. Okay. (laughs) So now, so here's the thing though. Isn't that interesting? And everybody, let me make that connection if you're not already making it. So the doctor's like, only in times of about to die will we actually test this thing. Why? Because that thing is the alarm bell. Well, why don't you test it before the alarm's going off on like a five alarm fire at the hospital with me? You see? That's why Dr. Forsman on my book tests it with everybody because it's nothing to do with your thyroid, right? A reverse T3 problem can come from having too much stress. It can come from heavy metal toxicity. It can come from, you know, like... Lyme disease, an infection, any, there's lots of things that can F with this feedback loop. Okay. And so again, I've spent all these years. So, so the goal is let's get to the bottom of it. But in the meantime, let's not be hypothyroid. So we'll be on T3 only. We'll do our best to clean out any underlying culprits. Hopefully we'll get to a point where either we're off thyroid hormone but if we have to be on it, then maybe we can be on a T4, T3 combo. So again, I'm not doing the math and I'm not able to F it up or overshoot or anything that it's going to probably be a little bit even better, or just, it's going to be less pain in the ass, to be honest with you. Um, and, and that is the goal. And if you can't, then you stay on T3 and you make sure all those things are still cleaned up. I had heavy metals. I had also a silver filling in my mouth. Um, so many things can affect mitochondria function and weight gain, but particularly thyroid. So again, it was so interesting that this doctor, well, we don't test that unless you're like on your deathbed. Then we test. That says everything about how important reverse T3 is. So, okay, so this is what happens. So the T4 then doesn't convert because it's sensing a danger. The reverse T3 is like alarm bell, Lyme's disease, alarm bell, EBV, alarm bell, whatever the thing is that is the, dist- it could be, it could be alarm bell tooth infection causing someone to get hyper. Well, it, it could be anything. But so whatever that alarm bell is, when it goes off the T4, your, your body, cause it's like, Ooh, uh, there's a inflammation fire going on somewhere in the form of Lyme, heavy metals, whatever, whatever it is. And so let's um, dial back 
this T3 because T3 is kind of like putting a little gasoline onto the fire and they've, they're inflamed. So we don't want to make this hyper metabolic situation maybe even worse or put any more inflammatory. So we're going to dial this back because we're trying to save their life in this situation. We don't know when they're going to get food next. We don't know. This is like the body just trying to save you. So it then starts to convert the T4 into reverse T3, which is the inactive form. And anyone in the world could challenge me on it, but the best way to visualize it is that it's converting into reverse T3, which is the inactive form of T3. It's doing that to protect your life, but in the meantime, you're getting hypo. So basically, you can imagine reverse T3 is like standing in front of a T3 cell being like, you're not going to get in. And so that if you're taking T3 or desiccated or, you know, T4, um, then when you're taking it, it's converting into this reverse T3. And it's kind of like, and this is why the labs might look normal is because it'll, we call it like pooling. Like it just pools in your blood. It's like, it's basically like driving around the office building and never punching into work because there's the guard standing in front of the door. So the only thing that's going to remove that guard are two ways to do it. You can try to do it through a natural protocol, decrease stress, handle all the underlying causes of reverse T3. Uh, you know, a million, and there's just like a million things you can do. It could be, oh my gosh, you're allergic to something you didn't know and you fix that. So you can try to naturally take milk thistle, do a lever cleanse, excess selenium, like even sometimes 600 micrograms a day for a while. There's lots of things you can do as a natural protocol to try to get that conversion back in action and to try to solve the reverse T3 problem. When it's unsolvable or too long unsolvable and haven't figured out yet, now you've been hypo and you're hating it again, what do you do? The only thing that will correct that situation is T3 because T3 does not convert to reverse T3. So then you start to give yourself direct T3. The T4 will start to kind of wash out of your system over, you know, probably a month or so, if, especially if you were taking high doses. And then essentially you are overtaking the whole process through just T3. There's no middleman now. There's no T4. That's why people on T3 only either take slow release T3, which is usually once or twice a day. I'm not a huge fan of it. I've never tried it, so I can't totally say, but based on my experience of talking to other people and what I know, um, I feel better to take direct T3, which is even more worrisome for doctors. Um, and you dose three to five times a day, usually. That's up to three, five times a day. I currently dose three times a day. I know people that dose four. I once dosed five times. It just depends on where you start, what your situation is. Um, you might start off at four doses and then after a few months, now everything's good. Your body's got that hormone in there. Shit has been corrected. Now you can maybe move to three doses. So in general, it's a little bit more of a pain in the ass with the dosing. Um, but it's, it's really the only, it saved my life. So then what happens? You start to feel better right away in the brain, but because that reverse T3 has been there, it can take like eight to 12 weeks for them to clear. And it's not like all of a sudden one day you're like, and stuff and clears and you feel this magical, but you do notice a difference where you're like, yeah, okay. Like now I think it's really working in my body versus just in my brain. So that's why you become hypothyroid on thyroid hormone. You're either not on the right dose in general because you have an idiot doctor that gave you nothing and you need more, or because you're on a dose and it's, it's backfiring. That's what, that's, that's what reverse T3 is. It is backfiring on you. And there's, this is why reverse T3 is so important to get tested, particularly right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. There are so many patients that get, they don't get reverse T3 tested and, and then their doctor says, okay, great, we'll put you on, you know, desiccated or armor or thyroid or whatever, right? Or just why? straight T4. Right. You so can still why get it. wouldn't yeah. you rule out, right? So mm -hmm. why wouldn't you as a doctor rule out the conversion problem before the conversion problem effing happens? Which they, they, they don't know about it. They, they have no clue how to deal with reverse they T3. They often don't. And that's not to say that if you have a bad reverse T3 result, you shouldn't go on desiccated. You go on T3 right away. But it might mean, okay, get some selenium going. Let's do some other stuff. And we'll try maybe a grain for a month and see if through selenium and some other things, it starts to convert maybe. Then if things still look bad at the end of the month, you go, okay, let's switch gears and go directly to T3. But there, so it's not always a prescription for T3 only immediately, um, but it always should be ruled out right away. And also, so reverse T3 ratio, we do, you can go to stop the thyroid madness or just 
type in STTM reverse T3 calculator. Janie Bothart, the author of Stop the Thyroid Madness, has an automatic reverse T3 calculator on your, her site, and you put in the units of measurement first, and the ratio between the free T3 and the reverse T3 Although Paul Robinson sometimes talks about the ratio between reverse T3 and T4, so there's some different perspectives, but essentially we look at 20 and higher being a good ratio. Now, if I'm talking to someone and they're on natural desiccated thyroid or not, and their ratio is like 16 or 17 or like something like that, that's not, oh my God, you know, that might be, all right, let's watch that, get selenium going, like 400 micrograms a day. I've seen a 17 go to 22 in just a month of the person taking selenium while they were upping their dose for desiccated. So it's not all, just because it's not 20 and high, you know, 15 and higher can even be healthy. If someone has no symptoms and they're doing great. For the most part though, when you start to edge below 16, when my people that are really hating it, like I've seen reverse T3 ratios at like one, but like 10, 11, those are really bad. Um, that's kind of when it's like, well, you can still try the natural protocol and do your best. And I go full force with it for about eight weeks. But if it's not solved after eight or 16 weeks, how long are you going to suffer? Get your shit on T3. So at that point, you know, it's a personal decision as to how long you're going to decide to go down the natural road. I did. I tried for a couple of months. I did high doses of milk thistle. I did all sorts of other stuff. Now at the time I didn't know I had heavy metals. Maybe I could have just done a heavy metals cleanse then and my natural desiccated would have worked right. I don't know. Didn't figure that out till years later. So there's so many avenues of so discovery, many. right? Yeah. There's so many, but you start with one and then you can go, all right, well let's correct it while I figure out what messed with it. Or let me, and, People have turned around Hashimoto's in eight weeks, people. I mean, I'm not kidding. I've seen people, hair and body, deflated, look amazing, skin, just because they were eating a bunch of gluten and they just didn't know they had Hashimoto's. And literally once they just got their iron levels up, took some B12, some vitamin D, went pa strict paleo, I've literally seen uh, miraculous changes. And Same. for anyone, um, you can look into Allie Miller, um, registered dietitian RD. She wrote a book called The Anti-Anxiety Diet. She's a paleo primal speaker. I interviewed her. She was on thyroid hormone at one point and she has Hashimoto's, but over time with correcting, you know, and doing all of the work she needed to do, she now does not take any thyroid hormone and her TPO antibodies are still like 14, but she's okay. She's symptom free. So I've seen people be able to stay off thyroid hormones, even if their TPO is around 10 or 14, but those people are like pretty dialed in. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Other, uh, usually people are on medication to feel right. So now a reverse T3 can, uh, situation can happen with someone who's not on thyroid hormone. And again, Lyme, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, Lyme's disease, um, some crazy infection, um, you know, heavy metals, all sorts of other stuff can just cause it in a person that's not on thyroid hormone. So I was on natural desiccated for years and it worked really well until it backfired. Now, when I look back the year prior to me getting the reverse T3 problem was extremely stressful, extremely stressful. And I probably, and at the time I didn't know all the things to do to support the, you know, I just didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't as aware as I am now. And so I'm not shocked when I look back. So I'm like, what was happening? around then. And then I'm like, oh, okay, this makes sense that maybe that's why I even got into it. Life stress did that, you know, and probably over-exercising and the, the stress of the chronic cardio and the stuff that I didn't know about that I know about now was an extra added stress to the body. So no wonder my T4 wasn't converting. I also found out later I had a selenium deficiency that could have done it just right there. And I remember the doctor being like, yeah, take selenium. And I was like, whatever. And I probably took like five in one week and then like didn't care. You know what I mean? So now it's just like, oh, um, so hopefully that, what questions do you have for me? Maybe? No, that's good. I think to be clear for Canadians to, there is no lab in Canada to test reverse T3. Your doctor, I, I just talked to my doctor about it. My regular MD luckily has a reverse T3 problem. And she was very aware of how it all worked. And I mean, I asked her if I could test my inflammatory markers and she said, nope, it's because you don't have an enzyme and you're not converting. And that's why you have reverse T3. And that is one of the causes. It can be that, but it's always good to look at all of it. I'm going to try and get it tested. I'm going to see if you can test for the enzyme in Canada. Yeah, natural. they're like the the deodinase. De 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 <laughs> I, I forgot how to say it. Yeah, something like that. Enzymes. There's two of them. And yeah. 
Well, yeah. there, and maybe that is, I mean, maybe it's a deficiency in the enzyme function. Again, it could have been heavy metals for me. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. All I know is that the, if T3 only didn't exist as a drug, I'd probably be dead. Yeah. For real. And I, I'm not even exaggerating that because see, again, I would have remained hypo for the past 10 years if there was no such T3. And I would have gotten several diseases and complications that I otherwise would not have needed to gotten because I was in a disease state all this time suffering and it would have just been all coming in and then patchworking it up. And I probably would have, you know, died an early, early death because of something mm -hmm. um, related to that. And look, I could walk out and get hit by a bus tomorrow. I mean, but you know what I mean? <laughs> For the most part, I think that that's, um, it's just scary. So thank God there is T3 only because, so it's the last resort though. It really it is. is the last resort. And that's why we're telling you guys in these, in this sequence of like, okay, you've been diagnosed and you've tried the Synthroid then you go to Nature Throid and it's like, if all else fails, it, you need to address it. But you can also solve the problem if you can find out right away if there's a reverse T3 problem. I did have mine tested right away. And it was in normal range at the time. It was, I think, just under, when I did the ratio, it was just under 20. So I didn't, I didn't, I just, you know, puffed it. And the ratio is very difficult to do because of the measurements. And, and then when I went back to being hypo, I got the reverse T3 checked again. And the number had come up, but was still not out of range on the lab. The ratio had gotten worse. So it was down to 15 or 16. Like she said, it should be over 20. So it wasn't like there was this huge red flag. It was more how did I feel and what was happening in my body that I knew there was something seriously wrong, right? Oh, yeah, you mentioned that. It came back a little bit with a vengeance too. So mm -hmm. I feel like I got even fatter. <laughs> well, I got just- I did, yeah. I was able to catch it a little sooner because I then knew kind of what to do to get to some answer. So I wasn't left, um, you know, not knowing like I was the first time. So for those listening, I had two bouts in a decade. One was the first one. I solved that with natural desiccated. Then I had a reverse T3 problem, solved that with T3. Um, on my second one, I really had severe, and I knew this was a symptom and I had never gotten the cracked skin on the inner index finger before, but my friend Kara, who's in the book, The Success Story of Hashimoto's we've been talking about, she had once many years ago tried to get off Synthroid and with like a functional doctor or like, you know, like a acupuncturist and she was trying to do a natural thing and we were at a movie together and she's like, oh no, I don't think it's working. And I'm like, what? And she pointed to this dry cracked skin on her finger so that when I got my reverse T3 problem and I saw that on my finger, I made the connection to her symptom. And I was like, uh-oh. And then also I got so fat around the middle. It was beyond belief. And by the way, I was still working on every day. I got so fat freaking fat, so bloated, so depressed. Um, Same. So depressed. I was it, so depressed. I gained seven pounds all in my stomach within a month. Oh, I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's happening? And then yeah. talking about dry skin, and this has never happened to me before, even when before all, any of this, my back got severely itchy. And I've never had itchy skin. I never had dry skin. And I was like telling my husband, I'm like, like is this part of my like aging that I have to like go, do I have to get a back scratcher? I would go get like tools and like be scratching. I'm like, get my daughter, I'm like, oh, please scratch my back. And I just thought like, gosh, it must be super dry out in the weather. Soon as I started T3, I haven't had an itchy back. And by the way, when I started T3 after my reverse T3 symptom, and I think I wrote it in the book because it was in one of my notes. And if I didn't, this is what happened. Like within just a couple of days, my dry cracked skin healed. It was the first thing I noticed was my skin on my hands. Now, and the reason this thing is a thing, and it's so interesting because I did a post on it on Instagram a while ago, and I took a photo because someone sent me a photo. They're like, is this, because I couldn't get a photo from when my thing, you know, I, I just never took a photo then. So I mentioned it and some guy texted me a photo, he goes, is this it? And it was, and it will actually, it will get to the point where we'll have a crack, like you will have a wow. split skin. Um, also dry cracked heels, you know, so again, any of this stuff, acne when you shouldn't have it. Um, waking up any kind of puffiness, but yeah, so it's, it's really interesting within a couple of days. So it did come back with a vengeance. It was really bad. The depression was bad. The only thing that was somewhat better about it is I had already had the experience of fixing myself once. So I had more hope do you know what I mean? I had a little bit more hope that I could do it again. The first time was probably even more depressing because I didn't know if I was ever going to get an answer. 
But this time I was like, oh, I'm going to an answer. And when that happened again, now more doctors, thank God, because of my book podcasts and just what's out there, uh, more doctors do understand reverse T3. They, they, they know about it, but for a while there, the only person that saved my life the second time was another thyroid patient. And again, I just want to impress the best selling thyroid books have been written by patients for a reason because we know what it's like. So Janie Bothorpe, who has the best website, stopthethyroidmadness.com. She saved my life the first time. I actually had one-on-one coaching sessions with her to help me. Um, Actually, the second time I did. The first time I was just on, she didn't have the book. She just had the forum online, the Natural Thyroid Hormone Yahoo group. And I, these women, the, the key thing that they told me was ferritin. And that's when I, that that really was the answer for me. So then I did my own research after that. Then I had the second problem. Uh, many years later, I, reached out back to Janie and I was like, what's happening to me? She immediately was like, I think you might have what's called a reverse T3 problem. And this guy out of England just wrote a book on it and I got his book right away and it saved my life. So again, thanks to fellow patients. And there are these forums online where fellow patients are giving free time of theirs to help look at your blood. work. You have to take all of it with the grain. Of, you know, you have to still follow your gut, but you're getting some input from people that have been there and mm-hmm. been through it. You know, and And just knowing that those resources are out there, I think are everything. Yeah. I go on the forums and I know a ton and I go on the forums and I appreciate what I hear from them. There's a Canadian one. There's an American one. Uh, Elle, do you know of a lab in the States where you can order blood spot test kits from to test reverse T3? Do you mean take home, prick your finger test? Mm -hmm, I had order. I, I, I wish there was a blood prick test for thyroid. I have not seen one. If there is, please. Oh, there is one, but I don't think there's one for reverse T3. Oh, no. I, I wonder how, I wonder how valid the, the, the doctors would say the prick test is versus actual blood draw for the thyroid. I'm sure a doctor would not say it's valid at all, but (laughs) yeah. Well, I'd just be curious to test side by side and see if you've got like, actually I have somebody that's just, she's just done that. So I can test people. I do have the kits to test for thyroid at home, but it's a, what we're talking about is a blood spot test kit where you prick your finger, you put your blood on a piece of paper and you send it in and they, they, they test it through their lab. Um, I don't, I've never had anybody do both. And even I haven't, I've always just gone to my doctor to get it because she's on board with me. So why pay out of pocket for it? Yeah. The reverse T3. So like, for example, here in the States, like Kaiser, yeah. they, they don't even, te- I don't think they even, te- there's just a lot of people that don't even know what it is no. or test it. And I'll tell you this. So I, because my functional doctor is not covered by my insurance, which is the doctor on my book, um, I, insurance here in the States, you know, I have a primary doctor. So yeah, if I got some horrible cold, I'd probably go to her, right? Or, you know, just something local, like I cut my finger. So for her, I used her to get like blood work and all that kind of stuff. When I went to her, I, I just met her for the first time. I got new insurance like six months ago. I went to her and I said, I brought her the list of blood, res- blood that Dr. Forsman gave me to take, which is kind of extensive. You know, there's stuff on there most people don't do. And I said, hey, listen, and I brought in my book. I said, full transparency. I totally wrote a book about uninformed doctors. <laughs> I said, I just, I, here it is. I said, I, I know you went to med school. I am not here to offend you, but honestly, my doctor's not covered by insurance. He's the doctor on my book. And this is what he'd like me to get tested are you open to testing these things for me, even though you're not the one that came up with the idea? And she was actually really cool. She said, she looked at it for a while and she was like looking at it and she goes, I'm happy to test all of this stuff. I just, I don't know what some of it is or how to evaluate it. Now, I really appreciate the honesty. That was awesome, yeah. yeah. But I also want to say, that be better have read my book and gotten on it immediately that day and gone home and go, what the hell are these? And why don't I know them? Why is this guy asking to get them tested? Maybe I should look into this. See, so hopefully that happened. I doubt it did. She was obese herself actually as a doctor, which is always rough to see. Um, And again, very nice. But here's the thing that happened to me too. I got totally suckered. I can't believe this. She was also like, oh, when's the last time you got a tetanus shot? I'm like, oh, no, it's been a... She's like, oh, and she gave me a tetanus shot. I actually said yes to that. And then I called Dr. Forsman afterwards on my book. And I go, uh, did I just get a vaccine I didn't need? He goes, oh, my God, you did not know you should not have done that. 
<laughs> so this going to add to the heavy metals that you already have in your body. Right. Well, oh, no. they said, he goes, well, thankfully there's no mercury in there. He goes, oh, well, it's the better one. You know, it's like the least. But again, like I even still oh, fell yeah. prey. Like I should have been like, let me wait on the tetanus. Let me call Dr. Forsman. But instead, and he said the reason is, is because like they literally push them. Like, they're selling them like to get as many. There's like quotas you make for the stuff. So anyway, it's great that she tested my blood work and maybe get a doctor who's going to do that. But sad that she likely, I mean, I want to hope that she went and figured out the things she didn't understand, but mm, mm. probably not, probably you not. know, and you want a doctor who's going to geek out and be like, I don't know about that. Why is that doctor testing that? Let me see what that's about. That's a good inquisitive, awesome doctor. Um, you'd also want the same in a lawyer. You'd also want, this, I mean, right? You'd want the same in everything. Like, let me go yes. look into this. Like, you know. Oh, it just blows my mind that doctors won't be open minded like that. That they're they're not even willing to go look at the newest research and and actually find out. Instead, they just put up their blinders and it's like, nope, T four only. We're only testing TSH. It's unbelievable. So you got to advocate for yourself. It sounds like reverse T three can't be. You can't do a home test with that one or can't get a kit from that. So you're going to have to go in Canada. You, you cannot do it through a medical doctor. You have to get a functional medicine practitioner to do it. My medical doctor told me that she's like, I can't test you for reverse T3. She said, Did I get in trouble. Tell you why? Did they say why? Just, it was against she said they don't know about it. It's not taught in, in school. She said they, and she just was straight up and she said, I get in trouble for prescribing T3 only to some of my patients. And I just know that some people don't do well on T4. They come back, they tell me they don't feel well. And because she herself has that problem, she knows to put them on straight T3. And she said, I sometimes have to give a little bit, I have to prescribe Synthroid just to appease my coworkers and the medical board and not get in trouble. And I just tell my patient not to take it. Okay, so so you can good see for her, but also speak up, girl. Then speak totally, up, yeah, right. So that's another thing too that kills me, right? It's like here she is, like, well, I get you should be putting your foot down, going, yo, everyone needs to come into the break room so I can give everyone a lecture on reverse T three, yeah. y'all. Yeah. So you can get up to speed, people. So it just goes to show you at every level, people are dancing around f and egos, and it's stupid. What about me? I'm sick. Help me, dude. That's your yeah. job, right? So that's part of this. It's, it's ego. It's how can a, another doctor tell me, an endocrinologist, that I'm not running enough tests? I've run enough. You know, really? Really, dude? How about just take the test because maybe it's necessary and why not and let me get better? Like, so, you know, this is what people are dealing with. It's very, it's very disheartening. You just have to persevere through it. And sometimes you just have to kind of put your foot down and go, listen, this is what I want to do. Are you willing to practice medicine for me? Because I'm willing to be compliant and on it and conservative about the way I approach this. I need someone to work with me. You might learn something, you know? So it's, it's tough. And sometimes you just have to walk away from some of these doctors, you know, or yep. dance around them because like, you know, they have a rough ego or they may suggest a vegan diet, but they know about T3. Well, you know what? Take them for what they got. You know what yeah. I mean? Oh, like, I dummy myself right down when I talk to her and I just, oh, right. Mm -hmm. When she's telling me all this stuff that I already know, I'm like, yeah, okay, but that's okay, right? If she's, at least she's willing to prescribe me T3 only. So I'm very grateful for that matter, right? Yeah. But yeah so you got to advocate for yourself. And if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh my gosh, this sounds like me, this might be something I'm dealing with don't quit. You keep going. You find the right person to work with. You find the right coach. You find the right doctor, whatever it is, but you get the book, you go to the websites, you fig you start to figure this out because it is something that you likely will have to take into your own hands and start to deal with because there's not a lot of people that know about it. So I hope that this podcast, this show has empowered you to to, to, to take this into your own hands. So thank you, Elle. I, I love talking to you. I love talking about this. And I know that you're helping millions of women on this. You've helped me. You've saved my life. And I know you've done the, that for so many other women. So thank you. Oh, thank you guys so much. And just, you know, remember everyone listening, no matter what you got going on, I don't care if it's thyroid related or not, you just don't settle with, I'm always going to suffer from X because I have X. Okay. No. No, there's an answer. I have seen the worst case scenarios beyond horrific, horrible. You wouldn't even believe do one eighties. 
you know? So you have to keep the faith and you do not listen to a doctor who tells you that, particularly about thyroid. Uh, by the way, Oprah's doctor told her that. He goes, well, you're always going to have weight problems because you have a thyroid. Can we please get a hold of Oprah? I've been trying to shout out, <laughs> call out to be like, please let me help you fix your Hashimoto's that apparently no one's fixed, right? And yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> And I'm not going to try to, I'm not trying to diagnose a celebrity here on this, but I'm just saying yeah. we see what's happened with her life. Is anyone maybe not, I mean, does anyone not suspect possible thyroid effery? And she does have it. So she was told by, now that was probably just an uninformed doctor who wasn't getting anywhere with giving her Synthroid or something, or do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or didn't understand the other components, you know, that, that are necessary. So just don't listen to that because it's just no. not no. And, you know, we've talked about all these bad symptoms that happen to us, but Al and I can both say now, and I'm only a little ways into T3 only, but I have been, I was on the IRFA prior to that. And it, it devastates me to think I could have gone a day longer feeling the way I was feeling prior to it. I had chronic migraines on a daily basis. I had, I, I'm not going to go into it, but I was not well. And I thank God my nutrition was what, where it was because I probably would have been a lot more sick, but I feel like I have a new lease on life. Like my head's never been so clear. I've got energy. I actually want to work out. I sweat. I want to interact with people. And I was kind of more closeted before I can just think so much better. I'm more creative, um, like a better sex drive. My, you know, my period got better. Like there's all these things that were related to it that I never would have thought were. And I just think, holy, how many women are suffering needlessly right now? So many. So many. One out of eight women will get a problem in their lifetime 23 million plus Americans have it. 60% are undiagnosed. Almost, look, everybody get your thyroid tested whether you have a problem or not so that yep. you know where it's at and you understand it. And you know, at the very least, read up on how to optimize it, okay? Make sure you're getting some selenium. Make sure you're, you know, getting proper iron levels. Don't, you can do some preventative stuff to make sure that you're not asking for a thyroid problem. You may get one anyway, but at least you know what I mean? You're not like heading in that direction of, of going there. So there's some, a lot of natural stuff you can do to just help support your thyroid and you all should do it. If you don't have a thyroid problem, just do it anyway, just to optimize and keep that thing working right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Elle. I appreciate it.